So um, go ahead, Jenny. Okay. Good morning and welcome to Preservation Virginia's long planned and now virtual mini conference on recording and preserving African American cemeteries. We know that there are so many, both known and unknown across Virginia. And this morning, we're going to virtually visit with the people leading cemetery preservation efforts in Loudoun County, Virginia. I'm Genevieve Keller. I chair Preservation Virginia's Board of Trustees, and I'm pinch heading for our CEO, Elizabeth Castelny, who could not be with us this morning. So I bring you greetings from Elizabeth, from our board, and the rest of our staff. And I'm calling in this morning from my home in Charlottesville, which occupies the homeland of the Monicans. And I'd also like to acknowledge that at the time of the Civil War, about half the population of Charlottesville and Albemarle were enslaved. So let's all remember together, wherever you are this morning, the indigenous and enslaved people whose presence still is so integral to the nature and culture of Virginia. Uh, first, I would like to give a special introduction and thank you to Sonia Ingram, our Preservation Field Services Manager, who is responsible for planning and coordinating this morning's program. Sonia, could you say good morning? Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Jenny. It's really nice to be here and um, looking really looking forward to this webinar. Um, I just want everybody to say hello to my special guest here, Patricia White. <laughs> Patricia is heavily involved in the Flippin African American Cemetery here in Danville. So, um, thanks, Jenny. Thanks, Sonia. When Preservation Virginia first started talking about planning this back in 2019, maybe even 2018, uh, we were looking forward to assembling together and visiting sacred sites on field trips to two cemeteries in Loudoun County. But of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has intervened and that's required us to alter our in-person events. We're hosting this webinar to provide general information on historic cemeteries and cemetery protection tools and laws. But at its heart, it's really the story about one woman from Loudoun County, Pastor Michelle Thomas, and her drive to protect the Belmont Cemetery for the enslaved and her successful collaboration with Loudoun County government and other local preservationists. This has resulted in the preservation of other African-American cemeteries in Loudoun County. We hope everyone this morning will gain some guidance and some tools to help historic preservation in historic cemeteries and to understand the importance of preserving African-American cemeteries, which have been disproportionately neglected across the state. And I'm sure that all of you will find Pastor Michelle's story compelling and inspiring and educational as we have. Preservation Virginia has been involved with protecting historic cemeteries for more than a decade. In 2010, we listed historic family cemeteries to our most endangered historic places list. Formal recognitions in Virginia may have begun in 1992 with a national register listing of the Stanton Family Cemetery in Buckingham County, a nomination I was involved in with Renee Ingram, a descendant of those buried there, and I'm not sure if Renee's here with us this morning, but she often attends our events, so hello to Renee if she is here, a real pioneer uh, in this uh, field of endeavor. In 2013, Preservation Virginia listed the Arlington National Cemetery and Landscape to our most endangered historic properties list. And in 2016, we listed African American cemeteries statewide. And in 2017, we relisted African American cemeteries with an emphasis on the Belmont Cemetery in Loudoun County that you will hear a lot about this morning. We've also been heavily involved in preserving the Flippin Cemetery in Danville, and we have highlighted or honored other African-American cemeteries, such as the Daughters of Zion in Charlottesville and her annual awards program for its research and preservation work. And now they have a count of more than 640 identified burials. And I see that Bernadette Whitson Hammond and Edwina St. Rose uh, the people who are most instrumental in that cemetery are with us. So I'm going to give a shout out to my friends and colleagues here in, in Charlottesville. They're also tremendous resources. As you know, we can't begin to cover everything about the preservation of cemeteries in one webinar, but we hope that this webinar will provide you with some tools and insights and inspire you in your own ongoing work or those of you who are initiating efforts now. First, 
a little bit of housekeeping. If you have attended our other webinars, you probably know that you'll be able to see and hear the speakers this morning, but that you will not be able to speak. However, we value your questions and we encourage you to submit them by using the Q&A button on your screens. Uh, we'll be reviewing questions as we move along this morning. And there are a few minutes at the end to answer questions. I dare say we will not get to all of the questions in our allotted time, but we pledge to you that we will answer them by email and we'll also provide contact information for all the speakers and their bios at preservationvirginia.org, our, our website. There will also be a recording of the webinar on our website. Uh, and, and we also would like to provide links to technical information that we won't go heavily into this morning, uh, such as gravestone identification and repair and the use of ground penetrating radar. We have a number of speakers and I'm just going to introduce them briefly and then they will sequentially enter the conversation as appropriate this morning. Uh, our first speaker is Pastor Michelle Thomas, an electrical engineer who's pastor of the Holy and Whole Life Changing Ministries International Church. This is the first church in Loudoun County established by an African-American woman. Current president of the Loudoun NAACP and the first African-American woman appointed to the Loudoun County Heritage Commission, Pastor Michelle, combining the influence of her personal roles as wife and mother with her advocacy for children and adults in our community and in our state. In 2018, Pastor Michelle rediscovered and since then has led the efforts to preserve the Belmont Cemetery for the Enslaved in Loudoun County. Her work at Belmont inspired her to found the Loudoun Freedom Center, an educational nonprofit organization dedicated to the preservation and education of African-American cultural sites, resources, and communities in Loudoun County and beyond. And in 2019, Governor Northam named Pastor Michelle to the Commission on African-American History Education, a commission that he is charged with reviewing Virginia's history standards for both students and teachers. The year-long commission included recommendations for the instructional practices, content, and resources currently used to teach African-American history in Virginia, as well as providing certification standards for teachers who share this information uh, with their students and others. We also have with us this morning, Kristen Brown, who directs the Loudoun County Office of Mapping and Geographic Information, otherwise known as GIS, which is home to one of Virginia's first established uh, GIS systems. Kristen has a Master of Science in Geography from Murray State University in Western Kentucky, and she is a Geographic Information Systems professional. We're also uh, very happy to have with us this morning, Ron Campbell, uh, Ron has worked as an administrator in higher education for more than 27 years at a number of institutions, including Pace University, the University of Pennsylvania, Drew University, George Mason, and the University of Minnesota. Ron is also an elected town counselor of Leesburg, and he previously served on the county's Criminal Justice Advisory Board and Technology Commission, as well as the Environmental Advisory Commission. In 2015, Ron, along with Pastor Michelle, helped found the Loudoun Freedom Center, where he currently serves as its executive director. We have a representative from DHR, Department of Historic Resources, our State Preservation Office this morning. Joanna Wilson-Green is an archeologist in the easement and archeology span stewardship. Joanna has worked for 20 years as a professional archeologist and anthropologist, and she's our DHR point of contact for all issues involving identification, restoration, and protection of cemeteries, as well as for permits for archeological investigations of human remains. Joanna received her master's in anthropology from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and her BA in anthropology from the University of Wyoming. Also with us this morning is Alexandra S. Gressett, director of the Thomas Balsh Library, a history and genealogy library that's owned and operated by the town of Leesburg. Alexandra, who has extensive experience in historical and cultural programming, works with a broad range of residents, organizations, businesses, and governments. She completed her undergraduate work at the University of Puget Sound, and she holds an MA in European History from the University of Washington, and an MA in Archival Administration Public History from North Carolina State University. 
Also with us this morning from Loudoun County is Heidi Siebentritt. Heidi is an archeologist and historic preservationist, and she's been the Loudoun County Historic Preservation Planner for more than 20 years. Uh, Preservation Virginia has recognized Heidi's work uh, with an award for outstanding service in community preservation in 2008, uh, especially for the county's historic districts and their interactive website. And finally, with us this morning is Carice Luck Bremer. Uh, Carice will be monitoring the questions as they come in, and she will uh, field the questions at the, uh, at the end of our program. We're really happy to have her with us this morning as well. Carice is a historian, genealogist, and program coordinator for History United, a place-based project of Virginia Humanities. Working in the Danville area, Carice collaborates with Virginia Humanities staff and local community members in the Danville area to establish a strong network of local cultural organizations that are committed to positive change. And she's also the founding president of the Danville, Pennsylvania County chapter of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society. So we're so honored and privileged to have all of these experts and committed preservationists with us this morning. And I'm going to hand uh, the mic over to Pastor Michelle. Good morning. Thank you so much, Jeannie. I really appreciate it. Um, you guys have heard our introduction. Um, basically, I'm a local pastor in the um, Lansdowne Loudoun County area. Um, we started a church in 2006, and our main goal, um, which is probably just like you guys, every good um, idea, every um, quest for preservation starts with some sort of goal or spark. So our main goal at the time um, was to build a church. And we are unique in the space where uh, we've been called to serve. It is actually a part of a um, former plantation. So lands down, the historic lands down, the beautiful lands down with the Arnold Palmer golf course. Um, uh, just fit, retrofit it with everything that you want to live here um, is a little unknown part of Black history. It was once the former Coton Plantation. Coton Plantation was a plantation that was owned by the infamous Lee family. Um, it was owned by Thomas Ludwell Lee, who was a cousin to... Um, uh, um, the Lee family. Um, and, and so what they wanted to do was we wanted to build a church here. We had no clue of the history. Um, but as we began to explore the options for building this church, we just found things that we couldn't ignore. First of all, in 1804, there was, and I began to do research, in 1804, there was a um, group of enslaved people um, kept on the property here in Lansdowne who was having a service. Um, they were struck by lightning and um, several of the enslaved persons died. Uh, after their death, uh, there was a byline put in Literary Magazine in 1804 that said, you know, uh, this incident happened. Um, it told the owner, Thomas Ludwell Lee, um, and it actually uh, became the impetus uh, for me really doing our research and feeling as if our church was called to be in Lansdowne because of its historic nature. My next question, um, if there was a, a, a families, um, African-American families enslaved worship in here, where were they buried, right? So, you know, they had to be buried here. Um, not really, because in that time, they could have just discarded them anywhere. We could not find the burial in Lansdowne, but we were able to find the burial adjacent um, to that property. That property was Belmont Plantation. Belmont Plantation was another sister plantation to the Lee family. It was owned by Ludwell Lee. Ludwell Lee was the son of Richard Henry Lee. I know I'm going fast. Just take notes or do the replay. Uh, he was the son of Richard Henry Lee. Richard Henry Lee was one of the original signers of the Declaration of Independence. Bingo. We landed a prime uh, location to do uh, to build our church having no idea that all of this history was right here in Lansdowne we began to find um, you know more about our heritage we found out that between the two plantations there were enslaved about 
a uh, hundred or so um, people. Um, through my research, I was able to chronicle those enslaved persons' names. That is where um, the story really picks up and um, co collaboration with the community really um, sets in. Many of you may have joined this morning with the same problem that I have or a similar problem that I had five years ago, which is you feel like you have something of great importance. You know that your ancestors lived there, but you can't chronicle it. You don't have the primary source documents. You don't have the names of people that may be buried. You need genealogy work. You need anthropology work. You need archaeology work um, to save and preserve the historic property that you're interested in. Today, you can find, you may find, I'm hoping that you'll be in to tap into our path and be able to chart a path to preservation in your area. Let's get started. So no man is an island. No man is an island. And so no matter how great uh, you are, and I am an electrical engineer, so the only thing that means is I know how to put things together. I know how to put them together out of the box without any direction. I know how to follow good directions. I know the full life cycle of a thing. And so I began my quest to preserve this history um, as an engineer, not as a historian. I did not have any previous knowledge in 2015. I did not have any previous knowledge of historic pre preservation or public history. Um, I gained that knowledge along the way. Some of it was formal training. Um, I went to uh, NOVA and enrolled in their Historic Preservation and Public History program. I'm a current student at George Mason in their anthropology um, uh, school. I am hoping to attain a second bachelor's in anthropology, but the bottom line is you have to do the work. So let's go into uh, the part that I think could help you most, which is to talk with our partners about the work that we did together. Um, my first stop after finding out that there were enslaved people buried across the street adjacent to the Lansdowne property, um, I was able to find that out in a very obscure way. Um, Normally, uh, well, back in the day, things have changed now, but in 2015, um, cemeteries were actually kept in an archaeological resource within the health department. So if you guys are having a problem identifying where graves are or where old historic cemeteries are, you may want to check with your health department. The health department at that time kept a list called the cemetery index list. We can no longer find it. Why? Because the people have retired. But I remember very plainly and succinctly that Belmont was listed as the Belmont Slave Cemetery and it was Cemetery 17. So please go check with your local um, health uh, department to find out if there are any um, environmental or archeological lists uh, resources listed, um, and you may find a section of cemeteries. Um, the next stop for me to gain more information about the cemetery was right to the library. Um, and we'll, we'll go into that. When I went to the library, I was able to find out who the owners, uh, the current owners of this property, Belmont Plantation, uh, who the current owners were. And this was great because it led me to speaking directly with um, Toll Brothers. Toll Brothers at the time had owned the Belmont Cemetery for about um, 30 years. They did not do any formal upkeep to it at all. There was not a historic sign. There was no markers. Um, basically, the cemetery was just um, covered, rebrushed, and abandoned. Um, we began to have talks about how to preserve this cemetery, and uh, these talks were not done alone. We brought in uh, people who could help us from the county. So Hayden Sibitrit was involved with those initial talks. Uh, Lori Kimball, who is a historian here now, um, and actually she was a part of the Black History Committee and started to try to preserve Belmont nine years prior to um, us doing this work. Um, and there were several technical people on the Loudoun County side that joined in with this conversation. I'm gonna introduce you to our executive um, director now, Ron Campbell. Thank you, Pastor. I uh, appreciate everybody being here today. Uh, 
my part at first seemed to be the simple part. You know, I stand by Pastor Michelle. I'm not a historian or archaeologist or genealogist. Uh, I've learned a lot in the last uh, five and six years, but, but it's a process piece. You know, we never intended to own. This wasn't a, a situation that we said we want to own this cemetery, uh, these burial grounds. The more that we learned, we really believed they needed to be preserved. And so uh, I have a brief slideshow that, that we're going to walk you through some of the points. There'll be some links to some articles uh, and information that you can get. Uh, but the idea um, on the next slide, the, the fight to save the the African American burial grounds uh, cemeteries. And there, and there is a difference, and you'll hear more later about the difference between a burial ground and a cemetery. But in, uh, in 2015, when we established the Loudoun Freedom Center, we really wanted to, to look at preservation, um, find out history, information, and along the way, we discovered ownership. So the first two links will tell you more about the story uh, and even the celebration a little bit. Visit Loudoun has a unique story that they now share uh, for visitors coming to Loudoun County. Uh, a local newspaper, Loudoun Now, has a, uh, a story that was in 2017 uh, about the Freedom Center and the Belmont Slave Cemetery, as it was known at the time, and our preservation efforts. Even in 2000, uh, 2020, uh, National Geographic uh, has an article again, that was published that details some of the story. And it's, and it's important to understand, again, how these stories can be used in your efforts. Um, because again, I'll go back and keep saying, we never intended to own, but what you'll hear about is the struggle to ownership. And the, the preservation efforts, uh, as broad as they were, there are a lot of allies and partners and pieces that we had to uncover along the way. And then the last link on this slide was, was even a, a bill uh, presented uh, by a representative, uh, Donald McEachin, McEachin, in the U.S. House of Representatives to establish a National Park Service African American Burial Grounds Network uh, because of the fact that there is no national record or database for African American burial grounds. And most of these uh, burial grounds uh, have been abandoned and not kept up and no ownership as well as no partnership where uh, whoever did have the ownership, whether it was a county, a church, uh, a family, or even a developer. And his main point uh, that really spurred us on um, was that African American African-American burial grounds are an integral part of our history. And the people whose lives and the descendants are, are still an integral part of our community, and particularly in Virginia and more even particularly in Loudoun County. So I think this, this first uh, links, again, just give you some idea uh, that your stories have value. Uh, they are to be told, but there, there is a process. So on the next slide, uh, is a little bit more about, about the struggle, the challenges. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the political ones. But, you know, I, I want to say, Pastor, this was an accidental discovery. <laughs> and everything that we discovered spurred us on uh, for more information and even more partnership with, with Toll Brothers. What was their obligation? We talked about the county. What was their obligation? The county didn't want to own a burial ground. Toll Brothers didn't want a burial ground wasn't affiliated with a church. And at the end of the day, uh, the path forward for us was about trusteeship with the county. The Toll Brothers would uh, transfer the property to the county. The county um, would appoint or at least nominate trustees to the court system for stewardship. And then Loudoun Freedom Center would take that stewardship forward uh, in terms of preservation and further research. Um, we, we got involved in some legal actions, some public policy actions. Uh, we got more invested in understanding state codes. And, but at the end of the day, uh, the questions and the challenges that people had for us, you know, as a, a lot of Freedom Center, 
do we have any money? And it always somehow comes back to money. How are we gonna, you know, preserve and upkeep? And, you know, are we financially capable? And who are we? Do we have the qualifications? And as we started to try to reach out, again, we understood that there are limited statewide networks, limited statewide resources. And uh, at the end of the day, um, we made a deal with Toll Brothers, uh, and Toll Brothers made a deal with the Loudoun Freedom Center that they would gift the property to us, removing the county, removing any other obstacles, legal or otherwise. We started with being satisfied with being trustees, and we ended up being owners. And that was a tremendous uh, opportunity uh, that, we've, that we fully embraced, but it also inspired us to look again, for models for preservation and, uh, and really look at Loudoun County uh, for other partners, which we did find in other, other communities. Uh, so the next slide, um, and again, I, I'm not going into a lot of details right now about all of the, the challenges that we're all met and we're certainly happy to answer questions. Um, but there is a path forward for you and that's what we wanted to talk about today. And I know other partners, uh, panelists out here, We'll also talk about other uh, concrete ways uh, that really do give us uh, hope that we can do a better job of finding our burial grounds, preserving them, protecting them, and even owning them. So the tools, um, politicians, um, some of these are policy actions, some of them are just simply embracing. And all of our uh, politicians that work with us in Loudoun County were a tremendous help and resource. And finally, you know, putting forth uh, uh, the African-American uh, burial grounds at Belmont uh, in front of the Virginia um, House to be able to be listed on the, on the Virginia Register as uh, historic uh, burial ground. Uh, developers, developers uh, sometimes don't wanna be as involved as we have gotten them involved, but the reality is some of them, um, when these projects come up, and they find human remains, uh, they either do the right thing or they do nothing. Or, and we inspired uh, other developers uh, to really look at their obligations and, and to do more. Our faith organizations, the African American, again, Burial Grounds at Belmont uh, has two tremendous partnerships uh, with uh, Eagle Scouts. And one group of Eagle Scouts from uh, a mosque, uh, Muslim organization, and the other from a Mormon organization. Uh, and we were able to combine history and faith and celebrations uh, to really do uh, what we have done, civic organizations, historic and preservation societies, from, uh, from Quakers uh, in historic Lincoln, Virginia, uh, to the Waterford Foundation, which I am now a board member of, of uh, the Waterford Foundation, and everywhere there was an African-American presence in Loudoun County, we now have an outreach uh, to those communities uh, to really build our network, our black history organizations. And as you saw in the links, our news, print, TV, and media outlets have been tremendous partners of helping to tell our story. So there are challenges, there are ways uh, in which we can move forward. And, and depending upon how each of these opportunities may affect your abilities for ownership, what we wanted you to really take away is that ownership is the path forward. That's the only way we can control the narrative, the only way we can control uh, the resources that we need to preserve and tell the story. And it's the only way we can make sure that our story never gets compromised. Ownership is, is the path forward. Thank you, Pastor, for that opportunity to, to share that little bit. All right. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to try to be mindful of our time as we do our presentations. I want to bring our partners in a little bit closer. Just to recap a little bit, um, you heard a lot from me and Ron, but there's a couple of things that you got to know. If you're on this web and you're trying to uh, preserve African American cemeteries or burial grounds, you probably are familiar with a quote, for, with a quote from one of our uh, black mothers. So black mothers used to say to us, I can show you better than I can tell you. What do they used to say? I can show you better than we can, I can tell you. As we move forward in the presentation, I want you to keep that in the back of your minds and make two notes. First of all, preservation starts 
at the point that you bring public awareness. Preservation starts at the point in which you bring public awareness. That's when preservation starts. And then number two, research and public relations is the currency of historic preservation. Research and public relations is the currency of historic um, preservation. These are quotes by Pastor Michelle Thomas made up right here on the spot. <laughs> um, I want to take you uh, into a deeper conversation about some of the resources and tools that we use to really find out this historic um, this historic path. So first you have to do, you have a hunch, you have a story, but now you have to put facts, right? Um, facts matter. Now you have to put facts to what you feel. And so I went to Thomas Bosch Library. I met a great genealogist. She's since passed, uh, the late Mary Fishback, and she was able to introduce me to a lot of resources. Let's talk to our, um, our historian and, um, and the keeper of all things research, Alexandra from the Thomas Bosch Library. Alexandria? Yep, just a second, I'm trying to... Get your PowerPoint up. Yeah. There we go. Um, once you have familiarized yourself with local and regional legal and cultural protocols and identified your research interests, it is always then the time to seek out repositories uh, of historical data. And these repositories will be both private and governmental and may encompass local cultural, religious, business, and fraternal organizational records. Be prepared to use imagination in your research for there is no one resource that will have answers to your questions and often resources that should have answers to your questions may in fact not, the records may no longer exist for fires or all sorts of reasons. But you need to make creative use of as many re available resources as possible so that others may learn from the research at the end of all of your work, please be sure to deposit your research at an organization like the Thomas Balch Library or some other entity because others will want to use your work. In Loudoun County, we are fortunate to have a wide variety of resources to uh, search. Resources available at Thomas Balch Library are typical of resources that you can be found in many communities and they include uh, maps, Never neglect maps, no matter how old or new or how scrappy they may look. We have worked with um, Loudoun County Mapping in their efforts to create a map identifying cemeteries throughout the country. You'll have more about this later, but there are historic and specific maps um, and there is an African American cemetery map for Loudoun County. Um, one of the things you'll look, need to look for, see if there are cemetery records, indices, and photographs of tombstones. Many different groups, particularly Boy Scouts working for their Eagle Project uh, badge, have walked the cemeteries, they've mapped them, they've photographed them, and they've listed burials. These are wonderful resources. We actually have a, 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 an index online of about 200 local cemeteries. By all means, that's not everything that there is. Another uh, resource to look at, church records. There are regis registers, minutes, histories. Some of those, there will be copies in the institutions. We have copies here at the Thomas Balch Library, but you often have to go to the individual churches to see what their records are, or they are on, like the Presbyterian Church has um, um, an archives in Philadelphia. Sometimes you have to go to the National Archives to find the material. We also have the Slack Funeral Home Index, so don't forget about funeral directors indexes. They're a wonderful resource. Um, one of our new collections, um, the late Elaine Thompson, an educator um, prominent in the African-American history here in um, Loudoun County and one of the founding members of the Black History Committee. Um, we received her papers uh, on her passing and one of the collections we've processed is the African-American funeral programs. These are wonderful resources to find out about the people and places where they may have been um, buried. There's also a large collection out of, I believe, Atlanta, Georgia, that's just been made public on this type of material. Newspapers are another source of information, obituaries, funeral announcements. And you Pardon have to look me, Alexandria. Pardon me? 
I'm so sorry. We cannot see your PowerPoint, and that is a beautiful PowerPoint. Did you share your screen? Yeah, I shared the screen. Let me. Let's see if we can share it again. Uh -huh. Just a minute. Okay. You're going gangbusters. So. Yeah, you have to click on one and then click share. And it did that. Beautiful. So, now you can see it, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I would just suggest. Um, just go back to the funeral programs number five. Yeah. Just click through them. There's the maps. Okay, there you Sorry. go. Sorry about that. Um, but anyway, this is an outstanding collection of material. One that you, um, I don't think more and more institutions are realizing the values of these um, memorial programs and making them available, highlighting them in their collections. So more may become available on the, as we move forward. Newspapers, there'll be obituaries and funeral announcements. Other resources that are available here at the library and in many institutions are family Bible records, printed genealogies and family files, the African American historic architectural files. We have a, a collection here, the Black History Committee co-sponsored with a grant, uh, a research that did uh, an historic tour, architectural tour of the um, county. There are land deeds, land records, deeds, wills, census records. We have microfilm copies of these uh, with printed indices and transcripts, so you don't always have to go to the court uh, to see them. We're open, under normal times, we're open more hours than they are right now, no, but um, pandemic aside. Uh, there are local histories you'll want to look at. Oral histories are a tremendous um, asset because people will have conversations about their family, mention funerals that they go to. Personal papers are another wonderful resource. Uh, I'm working on a collection right now of the Mont Betley papers, and they'll talk about um, funerals they've been to. They all talk about, because this spans 1840 to 1910, there are mentions of the passing of slaves and where they were buried. So you do need to pay attention. It's a long, arduous task to do that because they're not indexed um, to the degree that books might be. And then never overlook the ephemera files, which may have individual um, um, programs from funerals or events, unpublished papers. A lot of students do their master's thesis and never publish them, or high school students do research projects. We have a wonderful uh, collection of unpublished papers available here. They're indexed, they're available. You can go to our website and see what we have. And then there's some vertical files. Um, we also provide additional databases and other digital resources, which you will generally find in many different organizations. These are available for access only on site. Uh, Family Search is one that's available anywhere, but um, the rest of these, um, they'll pr help you find the genealogies of people um, and you'll be able to trace the families and the families of the owners of the property, uh, which is, will give you lots of leads. Um, and then um, if you're really stuck, come at the Thomas Bulger Library. We have wonderful staff. Uh, right now you do need to make appointments, but we have highly trained staff that can help you and lead you through uh, doing your research. And I don't want to miss out on talking about other town governments in Loudoun County and also the clerk of the Circuit Court Office Historic Records Department, Eric and Sarah. They're really helpful. We pass people back and forth to, with each other when we can't find stuff or they can't and uh, we're there to help. And the last slide that I have talks about how you can um, access us. This will be made available because with COVID we do have um, some restrictive hours you do need to make an appointment. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, discuss what we have. Thank you so much, Alexandra. This is a great point. Um, one of the points that Alexandra made that I want to reiterate was the need for uh, researching and finding primary source documents. 
a part of the large part of um, our success story was our research. Um, the fact that we could move forward in confidence, knowing what we found, knowing the historical value, knowing the uh, legacy value of what we found was because of uh, having collected primary source documents. I'll give you a list really quickly. I run them off. You have to write them down. Wills. Wills, wills of the landowners, those wills matter. Deeds, deeds of the landowners or slave owners, that matter. Judgments, judgments of the landowners and slave owners, that matter. Uh, census records, census records is often where you're going to find uh, the enslaved. Many of them will not have a name, but you'll find data about, um, you know, their work history and also their ages. Uh, tax records is another uh, great tool. Inventory lists, tithables, and uh, landowner, slave owner diaries. So once you get uh, your fillings uh, that you have found something special, and then collect the facts to substantiate that using primary source documents, now it's time to take action. You can't take action by yourself. You need to develop a team. And your team is going to start, uh, your team is going to develop through people and relationships that you make in your, um, in your area. So one of the first places we went to is our mapping department. And that's where I met, met the great Heidi Sibentritt. This is the county's uh, anthropologist, and she is amazing and uh, 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 my first teacher in terms of uh, historic preservation. So, uh, Heidi? Yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Pastor Michelle. Uh, so Pastor Michelle's interest in and, and frankly her passion for the Belmont Burial Ground really had several uh, repercussions for the county government and I'm, uh, Kristen and I are going to talk about those. So I'm going to start a little bit with um, Belmont in particular. So the county certainly knew about the burial ground. Um, we had it on our radar as a fragile archaeological resource that needed to be protected uh, from development. And the location and the general boundaries of the burial ground had been noted in several archaeological studies that had been done uh, because land around the burial ground had been developing. But as an archaeological site, we were concerned that if too many people knew it was there, it could be looted or otherwise desecrated. Pastor Michelle, however, had other ideas about how you go about um, protecting and preserving um, burial grounds in Loudoun County, and she uh, challenged the county and challenged me uh, personally as a professional archaeologist to look at things a little bit differently. So the general boundaries of the burial ground seemed fairly clear. Um, the burial ground is bounded by two historic rights of way. Uh, there's bedrock outcroppings uh, on one side, but no one had ever mapped the features within the actual burial ground, um, the features that were visible on the surface. And so that's what we set out to do. And in Loudoun County, we're lucky because we have historic preservation staff, we have a county archeologist, um, and we have an amazing mapping and GIS department and, and staff. Um, so we were able to do this. And we went out on a beautiful spring day, as you can see, you gotta wait for a beautiful spring day. And we mapped every, um, and flagged every stone, every depression, um, every rodent burrow that we saw to try to get an idea of what the burial ground looked like. We could also see um, where burials were located right up to the edge of a large area that had been excavated in the mid 20th century. Um, and that excavated dirt was used for fill uh, for the expansion of Route 7. And again, that was in the mid 20th century, but burials um, almost certainly were destroyed at this time. So with this information, we created a map that would help us understand where burials were situated on the landscape. And because the Loudoun Freedom Center uh, was negotiating with Toll Brothers at the time to obtain the burial ground, um, we could look at the burials in the context of a larger uh, historic cemetery or burial ground landscape. So we used GIS and LIDAR technology and historic aerials from 1937 and 1957, and we looked at the topography and historic drainages and water features and potential historic access points to the burial ground. 
And the burial ground was part of a much larger parcel, again, that Toll Brothers owned and was developing. And so when Pastor Michelle was negotiating um, for a piece of that parcel for the burial ground, um, she could argue for a larger piece of that parcel, not just the locations where the burials were, which is uh, in the beginning what, what Toll Brothers was interested in, in, um, in subdividing off, but she could argue that there's a larger burial ground landscape that needed to be preserved. Um, and that included the burials, the rock outcroppings, um, that likely served as focal points for burial services historically, and small rock quarry sites where burial markers would have been fashioned on site. And of course, the dry pond area, which is where the burials were destroyed, that, that area of excavation, um, which was sacred ground nonetheless and needed to be included in that cemetery landscape. So with this mapping exercise, we could also identify areas where interpretive signs and areas for reflection, um, benches, and other uh, outdoor furniture could be placed without disturbing graves or sacred spaces within that burial ground landscape. And it, I'm going to throw it over to um, Kristen now to talk about um, the next effort that the county did, and again, in fairly direct response to Pastor Michelle's uh, Belmont work. Good morning all, can everyone hear me? Great. So, um, thank you Heidi. In April of 2018, the board directed the mapping department to work with Heidi and consult with a number of different organizations to create a database of active and inactive cemeteries. The goal of this was to provide residents and developers with more knowledge of where cemeteries are located in the county. Loudoun is a, an area of high development and growth, and so part of this was to make sure that developers knew where cemeteries were going forward. Um, we were directed to consult with the Loudoun History Committee, the Loudoun Freedom Center, and the Balsh Black History Committee, as well as uh, with others. So in addition to the groups that the board notified, we uh, identified, we reached out to a number of other individuals. We had a number of questions that we needed to answer before we could proceed with this. Um, what do we collect? What attributes are of value to include and maintain in the data going forward? Will the Code of Virginia allow the county to make the locations of cemeteries located on private property uh, available to the public? Could we share that publicly? We also wanted to clarify the laws regarding access to cemeteries on private property. We knew that if we were able to share this map, folks would be interested in potentially visiting these sites. Um, we also needed to figure out how to present this information in a useful and informative manner so that it would be um, easily available to our residents and to businesses. So we also wanted to identify, um, I believe the direction just said, go, go out and map the cemeteries, but we knew not everything is called a cemetery. I think what modern Americans think of when they hear cemetery is a churchyard or a municipal cemetery with carved headstones. And we knew that was not the case for many of the burial grounds in Loudoun County. And so we defined for the board what we were mapping by burial grounds and cemeteries. We also wanted to make it clear that we were not mapping Native American sites. Um, it's well established local lore here in the county that a particular topographic feature is a Native American burial ground. And we knew that folks would reach out in an effort to be helpful and want us to include those on the maps. Um, we referred our board to the um, Federal Native American Grave Protection and Repatriation Act which basically allowed us to exclude those for their own protection. And so those are not included in our mapping. So there were, uh, um, in addition to the questions that we had to answer, we wanted to make it clear what rights and obligations do landowners with a cemetery on their property have and what rights and obligations do those who want to visit a cemetery and private property have? And the Code of Virginia actually discusses this, and I, Joanne, I believe, is going to speak to this a little bit further on, but it was clear that if you own, 
private property and there's a cemetery, you do have a duty to allow access to family members, descendants, or persons engaged in genealogical research. Um, on the other hand, if you're one of those parties, you do need to provide reasonable notice. This was important to determine in part because we knew that um, we had had some landowners who had blocked off access to historic cemeteries. They felt that people were trespassing to visit them and we wanted to make sure this information was communicated to our residents. We also, and this was equally important, we needed to know if we could map and share this information with the public. Most of the cemeteries in Loudoun County are on private property, and I'm including churches in that. Those are, they have the, that, that is private property in most cases. Only about 8% of the cemeteries and burial grounds we found so far in the, in the county are on um, uh, incorporated town land or federal government land. And so the concern was that, again, a, private, a property owner would object to sharing this information with the public. And the stakeholders all agreed this was important. Um, this was an important step long term for the protection of the cemeteries and burial grounds. And so we talked to our, our Loudoun County Attorney's Office. They agreed that cemeteries are considered characteristics of real property and as a part of the Virginia Code that speaks to taxation. We could share that information. GIS, Geographic Information Systems, those are also public records. And so they believed we had a clear, clear um, right to share this information with the public. Now there are exemptions from sharing site-specific location information if you're, if you're speaking about rare endangered plant or animal species, if there's particular natural communities, or if there's significant historic or archeological sites. But that isn't something that the property owner can decide on their own. That, that direction has to come from the public body. But at, at the end of this process and conclusion, our, our county attorney agreed with our stakeholders that we could share this information. Heidi alluded to this earlier. This is very different than it, it was 15 or 20 years ago when the thought was you needed to conceal these to protect them. Heidi and Pastor Michelle spoke about some of the resources that we used um, here in particular in the county. We had a number of groups that had collected records or created databases. We really relied upon Balsha's database of cemeteries. Um, we looked at the Virginia Department of Historic Resources database, which I know that Joanna is going to speak to a little bit later. Um, a lot of folks aren't aware the USGS has put all of their topographic maps, something like 200,000 online. And these are wonderful, we found a number of cemeteries in the county by researching the, that online resource. Um, find a grave, church and cemetery custodians. We also are lucky to have a lot of historic aerial photography here in the county. Um, and so things that you can't necessarily see now, if you go back and look in 1957 or 1979, which is right before the county started developing, we've used that as a resource. And then lastly, our local historians have just been incredible. And so results. Now I will note that we didn't find all 200 cemeteries after this 2018 direction. Um, I started here in 1998 and we had a local historian who would stop in and say, well, I found another family cemetery. Um, and my director at the time said, we need to track these because someday someone is gonna wanna know where they are. Um, Pastor Michelle mentioned the health department. We ended up um, squirreling this data away in the health department wells database. This is where we kept the, um, it was environmental records because graves and cemeteries can often be considered pollution points. And so it, it ended up being a good place to store this information. We assigned an, an ID to that. So staff consolidated these previous records with the new data that we found. Um, we mapped these as points only. We did not want to attempt to define the perimeters without a full archaeological study. Even with a church burial ground, you may well have graves outside of that fence. And so we didn't want to suggest to developers that we had defined all of the, the perimeters of the cemeteries. Um, as a part of this, we collected a number of attributes. Um, the name of the cemetery, if we could find it, if we could figure out the number of graves, we've included that. If there are stones and we have dates, we, we record the earliest and the latest burial. And we've also included affiliation. 
It was important to identify the historically African American cemeteries and the burial grounds that might have enslaved burials. And so at this point, I'm, I'm going to jump away from my slides and give you a, a quick demo of what we've put together. Um, everything I'm showing you can be found at our, um, the mapping department has, it's called the GeoHub. And so if you go to loudon.gov slash GeoHub, you can reach all of this information. This is where we show um, interactive applications and we share data. We actually have made the cemetery data available as a database download. Um, the first thing we did, we, we really wanted to take everything we had learned and help educate our, our residents on this. And so we built what's called a story map. And essentially, it just walks through explaining the why we decided to map, why the board directed us to map these, and some of the challenges of doing that. Um, considerations and challenges. Um, again, I mentioned earlier, folks think that cemeteries all look the same. And we know from our research and from going out and GPSing some of these points um, that they do not. And so we wanted to explain that. For for our African American sites and our, our burial grounds that have enslaved burials, we also wanted to make it clear that while we had mapped um, a good number of these, um, and I believe we have identified 45 at this point, only about eight are known to have enslaved burials. These are very challenging to find because they often did not have those, um, they didn't look like for, they didn't look like cemeteries to most folks. In uh, 1800, Loudoun's population was a little over 20,000. And we know a quarter of the people living here at the time were enslaved. And so out of the, um, at the time, the 200 cemeteries, we identified 45 as um, having African-American burials, but only about eight so far have been identified as, as definitely having enslaved burials. And so we wanted to communicate this information so that folks could, um, could be more aware of their surroundings and their properties. And so we also, as a part of this, set up a contact us page. And so if someone thinks they have a cemetery, they can fill out this form, they can drop a point on a map and they can attach a photo. That comes directly to my department and to Heidi. And so we can work with property owners um, to help them identify potential cemeteries. And we have um, since we launched this, we had about 200 cemeteries initially, and now we have 219. And so we've been able to, this has definitely helped us identify some. And here is the full interactive map that you can reach through the, um, um, through this tab right here to see all of the cemeteries and burial grounds we've mapped. We put a little notice up explaining to folks that you have to click through that the cemeteries are located on private property and what rights the property owner has, but also what rights that the residents have to visit these sites and the descendants. And so this can be searched on by, um, by cemetery name or by address or just by zooming around. I mentioned that we also make this data available for download. I, I think we may be the first um, jurisdiction in, in Virginia to do this. And so this includes a full database um, that can be downloaded as an access database. It also can be downloaded as a map file. And so our developers, our engineers who are in land development can actually download this and consult it. Um, it it's been really important, I think, to, to see all of these on a map, both to bring awareness, but also, um, you know, we live in a, 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 we all navigate by our phones now. And so um, to have this information out there, I think, has been particularly important. As a, as just a final wrap up, I wanted to mention that as a part of all of this process, we realized that Belmont, um, the enslaved cemetery really wasn't easily reachable. And so we worked with Google. We were able to both name the road leading into Belmont Cemetery, that is Freedom Trail Road, and it now appears on Google Map and an Apple Map. And so people can actually go and visit this site. And as a part of this process, we've made it a little bit easier. Um, 
I will end with that, but if you are interested in trying to map some of your resources, you're well, please reach out to us. I'm at mapping at loudon.gov and we're happy to, to share information and our knowledge and experience. And Heidi, I think I will, I think this goes back to you. Let's see. And I have to unmute. All right. So thanks, Kristen. It does come back to me. And I <clears throat> just wanted to mention that at the same time that the Board of Supervisors for Loudoun County directed staff to do this mapping effort, um, which Kristen's just walked you through, um, they also directed staff to create a cemetery protection ordinance. And um, this was to preserve existing cemeteries and burial grounds specifically as part of the land development process. So it's important to start off here to note that since 2002, Loudoun County has had um, a requirement for phase one or what we call our identification level archeology span um, from that, that has to be done for most development projects in the county. But to fully implement the board's direction that we wanna know where, where all of these cemeteries are and we want them located um, as part of the development process, we actually expand, expanded our archeological requirements even further to cover even more types of development. But in a nutshell, um, the ordinance does three things. It requires that a professional archeologist determine the boundaries of the cemetery or burial ground that's identified during the land development process. And then once the boundaries are determined, the new ordinance requires two distinct buffer areas to be drawn around that. <coughs> Pardon me. So the first is a 25 foot protection buffer. And um, you can see that in the graphic on the right of the slide. Um, it's a, the, the protection buffer is 25 feet. Um, it, it's the inner buffer that goes around the whatever the delineated cemetery or burial ground um, is, and it starts five feet from the outermost burial. This buffer is intended to protect the physical integrity of the burials and to preserve the natural and cultural features that may be associated um, with the burial uh, landscape. So in addition to the protection buffer, a 25 foot preservation buffer um, which is shown in orange on the screen, is required to create additional separation um, between the cemetery or burial ground and adjacent uses. And this is used to um, preserve the historic context of the cemetery or burial ground. So in a total, there's a 50 foot buffer requirement, which is measured, again, five feet from the outermost burial that's, that's delineated. <clears throat> and it, um, as shown in the graphic, if a portion of the cemetery overlaps into an adjacent property, that adjacent property owner would not be required to conduct any archaeological work on their side. Um, this is an ordinance that is triggered only by land development. Uh, I also want to note that the first 25 feet, um, <clears throat> that protection buffer, it can only be modified through a legislative action by the Board of Supervisors. The second 25 feet in orange there, the preservation buffer, it can be administratively um, modified if a developer submits what we call a cemetery, burial ground, and grave treatment plan. Um, and that plan has to address how the context of the cemetery would still be preserved um, even without that extra buffer. And last, I wanna mention the third thing that the ordinance does. The cemetery with its buffer areas uh, must be placed in easement um, with the county um, to protect it in perpetuity. Um, so in, in, this is really important because in cases where you don't um, have the Loudoun Freedom Center or another organization that's able to actually outright own the property, um, it allows the county to, to, to control what happens to the cemetery uh, under the easement. And so I think at this stage, um, well, I just, my last slide, thanks Kristen, sorry. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> the ordinance was adopted in January of this year, and I want to take an opportunity to give a big shout out to Prince William County because our ordinance, um, we started out with Prince William County's ordinance. Um, I think they were the first jurisdiction in Virginia to have a cemetery preservation ordinance, so they were the leaders. Um, but I think now um, Loudon's boasting what we believe is the most ambitious cemetery identification, mapping, and preservation effort in the state. And, um, we know that we have a whole lot 
more of these resources to, uh, to identify and preserve. Uh, but I do want to say that a straight line can be drawn um, between our efforts, our county efforts, and the work that Pastor Michelle did at Belmont, um, really challenging the way that we uh, look at historic cemetery preservation um, and, and doing things in a different way with the data that we have, the information we have. And unless Pastor Michelle's ready to jump back in, I guess I will pass it over to um, Joanna Green from DHR. Oh, there she is. I'm here. Um, <laughs> I just want to add, thank you so much, Heidi and Christian. I just want to add two things that our um, listeners need to uh, be aware of. Number one, um, don't be afraid to challenge systems and policies. Um, often uh, the system and policy is behind uh, preservation and your efforts. Um, so a lot of the things that you're finding is new or new to them. Um, and so don't be afraid to challenge systems and policy. Just have your facts. Just make sure you do your research. Um, there's two main things that you need to write down and make sure that you remember if you're on the end where you're trying to get ownership of these sacred burial grounds. You need to understand cultural landscape Cultural landscapes moves the uh, the the acreage or the uh, the amount of land that is affected or used to tell the story beyond the burial ground. That will greatly help you understand cultural landscape and cultural resources. We can talk about that a little bit later. Uh, the second challenge is don't be afraid. Um, to of what you don't have or what you don't know. Uh, your county, your town has resources that you could never afford. They have a staff archaeologist. They have a staff anthropologist. They have mapping and G GIS experts that's ready to work for you. So don't be afraid. Uh, just have your facts and move forward. Now we're going to introduce you to uh, this um, uh, our state uh, partner, where uh, a lot of the preservation happened on a local level, but we were um, able to have the cemetery improvement um, directive uh, bill actually uh, encompassed with Belmont so that we could get a little bit of funding to help us upkeep the graves. So let's hear from our state representative now, Ms. Green. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to share my screen with you here quickly. Okay. If I can get this to behave itself. All right, there we go. Um, with the Department of Historic Resources in Richmond, um, we're a division of state government with central office in Richmond and regional offices in Stevens City and Salem. We're a, a small agency, it's about 50 people at any given time. Uh, the office is staffed by a wide variety of historic preservation professionals, including archaeologists, architectural historians, regional historians, architects, conservators, curators, data managers. We have a little bit of everything, and we are here in service to the citizens of Virginia, which is a long-winded way of saying that we are essentially your historic preservation staff. Uh, we're on call to you, and we're here to help with whatever we can. Uh, we can help you do everything from identifying archaeological sites to listing properties on the National Register of Historic Places uh, to managing your own or the state's archaeological collections. We do operate two incentive programs that provide tax incentives for the proper treatment of historic properties, including rehabilitation tax credits and conservation easements, and we manage the federally mandated environmental review process. We also manage the State Highway Marker Program, which are those square white metal signs that you see when you're driving down the side of the road. So uh, we do just a little bit of everything in the office. We do have two roles here, and I wanted to, to make it clear that um, our regulatory role is very limited. Uh, we have no authority on private property other than the authority granted by the property owner. So. Um, our ability to respond to situations on private land is directly related to our ability to reach out and create relationships with landowners. And that's something that we take very seriously. Uh, from a regulatory standpoint, we are responsible for issuing and administering burial permits, uh, cave permits and permits for archeological work on state property, not private property, just state. 
Uh, we're responsible for the environmental review process and for the administration of our incentive programs. Uh, our advisory capacity is much wider. Uh, this is where we really let the rubber hit the road and work with the Virginia public to identify, protect, and preserve historic resources. Uh, we maintain a comprehensive archive and GIS-based database of uh, historic resources across the state. That's known as our VCRIS, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. We provide technical assistance on all kinds of different issues uh, from below ground to above ground, historic neighborhoods, um, historic outreach, any kind of questions involving historic resources, we can find someone in the office to help you with that. We do a lot of education and outreach, uh, including a, an ongoing cemetery workshop program that we've been doing in consultation with Preservation Virginia for over 10 years now. We engage in field identification of archeological sites, cemeteries, historic properties, that sort of thing. And we record cemeteries. Uh, we record them ourselves and we help others record them as well. Uh, this is a view of our citizen cemetery form. It's similar to the, the form that Loudoun County uses. Uh, we developed it specifically for the use of folks who are not professional historic preservation professionals. Um, this is a easy to use, very straightforward form that allows us to get information uh, from the citizens so that we can transfer it into our database. Uh, once that form is filled out, you would send it to our office, to our data manager, to me, um, along with whatever kind of supporting information you think we need to have. Uh, we love maps. Uh, we like aerials. We like anything showing us where the cemetery is located and how big you think it might be. Photographs of headstones of the landscape of existing conditions are terrific. And any other documentation that you can find. Um, vital records, church records, family records, deeds, plats of survey, anything that can help us place a cemetery within not only its own context, but the context of the surrounding community is extraordinarily helpful to us. Um, I can't emphasize enough the importance of getting this information on record. If we don't know about a cemetery, then we can't advocate for its preservation. Uh, we can't tell developers that it exists and they need to find ways to avoid damaging or disturbing it. And we can't find ways to help fund its preservation. The same goes for local government records. Um, if you know of a cemetery and you're comfortable sharing its location, then don't just share it with us. Share it with your city or county planning office as well and make sure that it's a part of any discussions that they're having at the local level that might affect that cemetery. This is what uh, records become once they're into our VCRIS. Um, it is, again, a GIS-based database. Um, we will provide the resource with a uh, GIS polygon that shows its location and, to the best of our knowledge, its extent. Uh, and this will be directly linked to a, an architect or an archival record that contains all of the information that we can find on this resource. Uh, locational data, elevation, landform, um, transcriptions of headstones, anything else that we can find will go into this record and then that record can be updated at, as needed and as wanted going through time. This information is available to researchers, it's available to land managers, uh, it's available to our staff when we are working on environmental review, working on site stewardship, land stewardship issues. Uh, we can take this information and it helps us not only to better understand a property, but to better understand how to assist property owners in, in looking after what they have. All right, I'm gonna take a very shallow dive into Virginia State Code as it pertains to cemeteries. Um, there are a few dozen laws that directly pertain to cemeteries in the state of Virginia, and we have just far more than we ever have a chance to get into in this discussion. So I wanted to leave you with just a few basic concepts um, to take home with you. The first is that the majority of cemetery law accrues to the benefit of the landowner. This is a property rights state, and at the state level, if you don't own the land, then you don't have the rights. That's that's just the bottom line. That's um, that's why I think that that all the discussions we've had up till now about the importance of land ownership are so crucial. 
if you don't own the land, your rights to do anything with that land are severely curtailed. Um, there are a lot of laws that prohibit damage to cemeteries and to elements of cemeteries, but these are specific to what we call willful and unlawful damage, meaning um, the kind of damage someone knows that they're doing damage, somebody knows that it's illegal and they're doing it anyway. It doesn't apply to things like accidents. You know, um, so a tree coming down and tipping over a headstone is not considered willful or unlawful. Somebody accidentally backing a vehicle into a cemetery fence is not considered willful or unlawful. The law would not apply to that. Um, it does not apply to actions taken under a permit or a court order. And it also generally doesn't apply to church owned properties because those are considered ecclesiastic uh, more than they're considered private. Uh, there are no laws that expressly prohibit the removal of human remains to another location. Um, I think a lot of us believe that once we're buried, that land remains sacred, not just to us and our families, but to everyone. And in Virginia, that's just not the case. Um, there are several avenues uh, by which buried human remains can be removed and placed in another location. So um, again, Property ownership really is the only hedge against that kind of activity taking place. And there are also no laws expressly required that property owners care for cemeteries on their properties. So um, you may have a cemetery on your private land. You are not required to actually take care of it only to avoid damaging or disturbing it. Um, all of this is to say that it truly is up to local governments to pass laws that are actually protective of cemeteries and that don't automatically default to property rights. And that's something that I think Loudoun County has done in an absolutely exceptional fashion. And this should be a model for localities across Virginia. Uh, that said, we do have a couple of laws that are of use to those of us who are interested in the protection and preservation of African-American cemeteries and all cemeteries. And the first was previously mentioned, this is 57-27.1, access to cemeteries on private property. This law does require that the owners of private property must allow visitation by certain groups of people. That includes family and descendants, the legal owners of burial plots within a cemetery, uh, and genealogical researchers. Uh, this could be for the purposes of visitation, memorialization, research, and for cemetery maintenance. Uh, property owners are prohibited from blocking access. They cannot build a fence or a wall or another enclosure unless that fence or wall or enclosure includes a gate that allows access to the cemetery inside. Um, Visitors, on the other hand, have certain responsibilities. They must provide reasonable notice, whether that's in writing or as a phone call or knocking on the door. Um, you cannot just walk onto somebody's property to go look at a cemetery. That's still considered trespassing. You need to provide reasonable notice to the landowner and let them know that you're going to be there. I mean, that's for your safety as much as anything else. Um, visitors cannot access these properties by vehicle without the landowner's written permission, so don't go driving your truck across their lawn to get to the cemetery. Uh, and uh, visitors are liable for any damage that might occur as a result of their visit. Uh, the property owner is not liable for any damage that might occur to the visitors. So if you were to put your knee, leg in a hole and break your knee, then the property owner is not responsible for damages to you. Um, a property owner that denies you access to a cemetery for these reasonable purposes may be taken to court. Uh, and the circuit court may elect to actually dictate the terms under which you are allowed to visit a cemetery. That really is a nuclear option. And you should try to exhaust all other possibilities before you take someone to court. But the law does provide you with that opportunity. The other statute that I think may be of interest to our viewers is uh, a very recently passed one. This was passed in the General Assembly session of 2017 for the disbursement of funds specifically for caring for historical African American cemeteries. Uh, this is a fund that's dispersed by my office and we're always happy to answer questions or, or help you to get a cemetery that you're interested in into the process. This is specific to graves and cemeteries established prior to January 1st, 1900, and specifically for the interment of African Americans. This doesn't mean that um, 
a cemetery with uh, white folks and other folks buried in it is ineligible, but only the graves of African Americans would be eligible for this funding. Uh, we do check records, we check headstones, uh, we make sure that there is some sort of documentation confirming that uh, the grave or the cemetery was established prior to this date in order to proceed with the funding. Uh, the cemetery must be owned or maintained by a qualified charitable organization, meaning uh, someone who is registered as a 501c3. Uh, if this is a maintenance situation, then the organization maintaining the cemetery must be organized for the primary purpose of the care of this historic cemetery. As of right now, the cemetery must also be formally listed in this statute, and this requires the assistance of a General Assembly member who would introduce it by bill during a General Assembly session to have it added to the statute. We are trying to get that changed right now because that's, that's onerous, um, but uh, that, that remains to be seen what happens in this current General Assembly session. Um, as it is right now, if you have a cemetery or graves that you think uh, would fall under this category, then speak to your General Assembly representative and ask them to introduce that as a bill as soon as possible. The funds are set at $5 per eligible grave. There is no matching share required, so this is a straight grant. You are not required to put up any money of your own. Uh, and there may be larger one-time disbursements for extraordinary circumstances, um, maintenance, repair, landscape restoration, that sort of activity. But again, the General Assembly representative must uh, support that through an appropriation in that General Assembly session. So uh, there are some hurdles to jump through, but this really is the only dedicated source of funding for caring for African American cemeteries of which I am aware. So if any of our viewers have questions about this, please feel free to contact me and uh, we will walk you through it. Uh, again, there's, uh, there's far more that I could talk about. I could probably talk for the next two hours and I'm not gonna. Um, but if you want any more information, if you'd like to access our archives, uh, record a cemetery, or if you'd like a member of our staff to speak with you or come to your property to, uh, to take a look at what you found, please contact us. Um, all of our staff is available through our website. We're working remotely, but we're happy to respond to emails and phone calls and uh, we're happy to, to get out of the office in the field and help you as much as we can. So thanks for your time this morning. I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thank you so much. Well, you remember uh, the quote that I gave you from uh, black mothers around the world. I can show you better than I can tell you. I'm actually live on site at the African American burial ground for the enslaved. Notice that this uh, burial ground is not listed by its former name which was the Belmont Slave Cemetery. That's because as soon as we gain ownership of it, the same day we file for a more appropriate name, which is the African American burial ground for the enslaved at Belmont. Why? Because it is impossible for African Americans to ever be slaves. Slavery is an institution. And so uh, we were actually um, enslaved and not slaves as the institution. So it is a um, familiar practice uh, that you will find a lot in a lot of the recorded books, but I'm entering into this sacred space now. Um, as you heard, the Belmont, uh, the African-American burial ground for the enslaved has about five main features. Uh, the first feature is Preacher's Rock. We're nearing the end of our time, so I'm gonna go through this uh, really quickly. Preacher's Rock is that sacred space where uh, the pastors would mount this flat area and they'll begin to have uh, the ceremony. All of the ceremonies took place at night. Why? Because the enslavers would not allow uh, the enslaved to skip time off of work to celebrate their loved ones. And so all of what you see here in terms of a burial would have happened at night. We're entering into the burial ground. That's our second feature. The first feature again is Preacher's Rock where the ceremony began. Then they would leave the ceremony and they'll enter into this burial ground. You can see field stones. You'll see head, headers and footer. The burial orientation of this burial ground and many African American burial grounds would be east to west. Uh, it's a uh, known adage that um, 
African Americans decided that they wanted it to be buried east to west. And so in the resurrection, they would rise and head to the east without turning around. All right, we have our third feature, which is a dry pond. This is very unfortunate. In the 1950s, there was an issue with the water main in, at the plantation house. Um, the owners came in and they encroached on the grave. They dug out the burial grounds and they later used um, the remains to build out Route 7. Very familiar um, thing that would happen in burial grounds. They were often uh, desecrated. This is our 400 foot trail that was built by Eagle Scout in 2018. His name was Mikiel uh, Martinez Jaca. He built this trail so that we could take school kids and visitors around this loop to see all of the features. Our third feature, I'm sorry, our fourth feature is the schoolhouse. In 1857, the fifth owner of Belmont, which was John M. Wilson, wrote in um, a deed that there was a half of acre burial ground um, adjacent to that burial ground was a schoolhouse. Um, we know in 1857, that is pre-emancipation. So that means that uh, the enslaved um, at Belmont was actually learning. They were here and they, they were learning. And so we wanted to make sure that we showed this as we come out and, um, and take our tours. And so many kids always ask, why were there mark any markings or any names written on the headstones? Did they not know how to read and write? And obviously the answer is uh, totally different. The answer is not that they didn't know how to read and write. It was that the en enslaved were um, not permitted by law uh, to actually display that they could read and write. We go around on this 400 foot loop and we marry um, the old with the new. We're entering into the rockiest part of this estate. Um, this 2.75 acres burial ground uh, was given uh, as a burial spot for the enslaved. Why? Because uh, it was a place that was not farmable. It was not useful to the owner. Um, this area is filled with rock stone. It is impossible. There's over 26 uh, small, medium, and large rock quarries found in this little 2.75 acre. I'm standing in uh, the largest of the rock quarries in this area. And the old has met the new here um, because my son was buried in this rock quarry. It was amazing because when my son died in June 4th, um, this was our opportunity to put ownership to the test, um, to put real preservation to the test. And we were able to do this uh, because the county granted us um, the right to bury, to add a new burial to this historic burial ground. What does that mean? That means that those sacred spaces that we love um, can be reusable today with a change in policy. So this is the most exciting part of, of this burial. When you own it, you can do what you want to do. My son was a football player, so notice that we uh, took the sod up and we added turf to the field. Yeah. We created a kid-friendly space for all the visitors without losing the sacredness of this space. Here are other rock quarries that are still intact. And as you can see, this space is absolutely beautiful. I wanna stop right here and give deference to any questions while we're still on site. Hello everyone, time is of essence. Um, so we don't have enough time to get to every question, um, but we will take a few, um, try to take a couple anyway. Um, the first one that I'm going to put out there is, what do I do if a cemetery is damaged and who do I call? So who wants to answer that one? <laughs> I'll take that one, Carice. Um, Call the police. Immediately call the police. Make sure that an officer comes out and files a formal report. You're going to need that. Um, 
when that happens, then you need to be in contact with the property owner. If that is not you, share the report with them and follow up with the police to see uh, if they can help you identify the perpetrator. Um, it really is, it's a law enforcement issue. Okay. Um, the next question is coming from Robin Burke. How can we transfer a family cemetery to an entity that will ensure preservation? Does the state want to answer that? Robin, it can absolutely be done. Uh, first of all, you, you establish the nonprofit and then you work within the confines of uh, the state law and, uh, and your local officials to make sure that that transfer happens. It's gonna require uh, that you probably go to court and get that done, um, but it, it absolutely can happen. Okay, I have one more question um, that I'll be able to take. And the next question is coming from Wayne Davis. I am researching a cemetery that seems to be devoted to African-American burials marked with fillstones at the head and foot. Land records led me to believe these burials were most likely between the 1840s and 1860s. I can't seem to find anyone in my area with expertise in African-American African burials that can help offer advice other than good luck. Is there some way I could speak with someone associated with your effort? At the very least, getting encouragement to keep the working on this would be helpful. Sure, Ron Campbell is our executive director from the Loudoun Freedom Center. Um, he could work with you. I would be happy to advise in any capacity um, that we can. Um, but it, unfortunately, it is kind of limited in terms of who you could work with. But try your local town and your local county. They're often one of the best resources. One of the first things that you could do and the most important thing that you can do is get, make sure that that cemetery is mapped. Um, when Christian and Heidi talked about mapping, that was one of the first points of um, success that we had, making sure that no one could ever um, uh, desecrate it, making sure that uh, it wouldn't be sold off or redeveloped over. And so if you want to protect that, get it mapped right away, work with your town or your uh, local officials to do that. Okay, I'd like to thank you all for participating in today's webinar. Although we weren't able to get to every question, after the webinar is over, we will, we will, we will excuse me, <laughs> got a little tongue tied, but we will respond to each email directly. Thank you so much to everyone who participated. I think at our peak, we had 145 participants today. Thanks to all of our, our speakers and presenters, I'm filled with inspiration and gratitude for all that you've done, are doing, and are going to continue to do. Let's preserve Virginia. Let's tell everyone's stories for, for everyone, and be sure to continue to visit preservationvirginia.org. Good morning, and thanks again. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Pastor Michelle. And um, like uh, Carice said, we'll be answering everyone's questions. So. Thank you and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Thank you.